Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening to our online audience, which I know is joining us from around the world. I'm Susan Myers with the UN Foundation, and as you've heard from our previous speakers, and I'm sure many others, the Sustainable Development Goals are truly a transformative agenda. And in many ways, they've already started transforming the way we are thinking about solving global problems. One of these areas is certainly around data, which I'll say is an old UN hand, went from what was really seen as a dry and technical issue to one of the sexiest issues on the global agenda through this process where we built and then launched the Sustainable Development Goals. This is in part due, due to the rise of technology and big data, which allows us to capture trends as they're happening in real time, but also due to the leadership of the UN and others, which really made the, da the data revolution one of the central issues on the sustainable development agenda. So it's no surprise that when we and our friends at Skoll and TED were talking about how to organize this day around drivers of systemic change, that we chose data as one of those four areas that we, we would dive into. So this next segment is going to allow us to dive into the issue of data. Um, it, we'll be talking about how the collection, analysis, and storytelling aspect of data can help us drive train, cha change. We're also going to be looking at individuals and organizations who are using data in new and innovative ways, and also about the massive gaps in data collection that we need to fill if we are to truly realize the 2030 agenda. We'll do this in three sections. First, looking at the gender equity gap. This is a huge issue when it comes to data, and it's one that currently leaves many women and girls behind around the world. We're going to be looking at how data can be used as a backbone of, backbone of fighting corruption, which is also a central issue in SDG achievement. And finally, how official and consumer data can be looked at together to tell us new things about the world and how to work, make the world a better place. We're going to start by watching a quick video, and then I'm really pleased to be joined on stage by my good friend and colleague, Emily Corey Pryor, Executive Director of Data2x, who will kick off segment number one. Good morning and good evening, everyone. So to, uh, to start off, first I should say I'm Emily Corey Pryor. I'm executive director of, of Data2x. And I have a little pop quiz for everyone. Um, what does the number 17 refer to? <laughs> the goals, very good. I'm glad we're all awake. Um, how about the number 232? OK, I'll help with that. I think I heard it. Oh, right here in the front. Indicators, 232 indicators. So, and now the quiz ends. So you did very well, A++. Um, so of those 232 indicators, 53 of those indicators are explicitly about women and girls. But only 15 of those indicators are available. So that means that we're about 20% of the way towards 2030, which is our goal for achieving these 17, or our time frame for achieving these 17 goals. But we still have about 70% of the way to go in terms of having the data that we need to adequately collect information that reflects the lives and realities of women and girls. So why do we have this problem? 
we have this problem because right now the way that systems are set up are, uh, are set up in such a way that makes the data that we have either incomplete, so we don't have data, we don't have disaggregated data on women and girls across a whole host of, of, of areas of health, education, economics, political participation, and human security, or the data that we do have is biased in some way. And that's why Data2x exists. We're trying to do something about that. But in order to shift massive systems, and when you do shift massive systems, and you see those changes happening for people around the world, that means that there are people behind those data systems. A lot of times, even though it's great to hear from Susan that data is now a sexy topic, a lot of times people see it as a very kind of arcane, um, erudite topic that seems impersonal. But when we're seeing those massive shifts in data collection and improvements around the world, that means that people's individual lives are changing. And in order to really make sure that we understand the stories behind those statistics and that we understand understand how those individual lives change and how you use those stories and use that information to change people's lives, you need powerful voices to do that. And I am so pleased to have a tremendously powerful voice and gender data champion and gender data advocate with us here today, Her Majesty Queen Rania of Jordan. She's been a huge friend to us and I'm so pleased to welcome her here today. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Today, we collect data on almost everything. We know that on average, you touch your cell phone 2,617 times per day. We know how many households in London own dogs, 312,000. How many ants are in New York City, 16.7 billion. <laughs> how many Javan rhinos are left on Earth, 62. We even know which country had the highest proportion of Google searches for Game of Thrones. Can you guess? It was Turkey. But when it comes to women and girls in the developing world, too often we know almost nothing. Millions of women aren't even included on household surveys. They literally don't count. And this is a problem. Good policy decisions depend on good data. How can we accelerate sustainable development if we overlook half of humanity? The SDGs represent high ideals, but they're nothing without hard data. Without hard data on women and girls, we're working blind. We know that, for example, conflicts impose a particular burden on women. I've met so many refugees who've shared their struggles and pain. Women like Wafa, desperately trying to feed her newborn son. Yasmin, who pleaded, I just want my children to go to school. Siham, who'd lost both her husband and home, who said, it feels like the world doesn't see us. If we are to meet these women's needs, we need to understand the realities of their lives. Yet, we have gender-specific data for less than half of displaced people. It's the age of the algorithm, but when it comes to development, half the map is in shadow. And these gaps in understanding become black holes that keep women from getting ahead, not just women in conflict zones, but women and girls worldwide. What happens to girls who dream of getting an education, but are forced into early marriage and fall off the radar, their horizons shrinking at the very moment boys' horizons expand? What happens to women who want to start a business, but cannot get a loan because financial institutions don't have enough data to appreciate the importance of female customers. What happens when government's labor statistics fail to capture women's true economic contributions? The many hours women devote each day to cooking, cleaning, and taking care of others, or supplementing this family income through piecework and microenterprise. When we allow biases about women's roles to color the kind of data we collect, we reinforce those biases, making women seem less capable less productive, and more helpless than they are. The good news is there is new momentum for collecting more complete gender data. One leader in this movement is Data2x, a champion for data equality, which works with governments, UN agencies, statisticians, and civil society to fill gender data gaps. Data2x is spearheading research that taps big data sources 
to illuminate aspects of women's lives that are otherwise left out of official statistics. When we have the full picture, we can better focus our investments to get results. In 2000, for example, the primary education completion rate was about 80%. But because this data could be disaggregated by sex, we could see that the rate was even lower for girls than boys, 76% compared to 82. With this knowledge, the effort to get children through school could be tailored to meet specific needs, so that by 2015, the rates had, had risen to 90% for boys and girls alike. That's the kind of progress we want to see across the board. It's a bold new frontier, and I challenge more data scientists to map its terrain. I also ask journalists and citizens everywhere to help hold decision makers accountable. If we are the future, let's insist on a future where everyone is valued. Let us join in saying that gender equality is only possible with data equality, that we need unbiased data in order to design the best possible policies. And let us join in saying to Wafa, Yasmin, Siham, and women and girls everywhere, you are not invisible. You are not just a number on a spreadsheet. You do count. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Majesty. It's an honor to have you here with us this morning, and the fact that you're on our side when it comes to this critical issue gives me hope that we can get the rest of that 70% of the way there that Emily mentioned um, for where we need to be by 2030. It is now my pleasure to introduce Gillian Caldwell of Global Witness. She will share with us how Global Witness is working to tackle critical environmental and hum human rights abuses around the world by util utilizing tactics of investigation, data, and partnerships, Global Witness seeks a world to create a world where corruption is challenged and accountability prevails, which is truly a, a noble mission. So thank you, Gillian. Hello. My name is Gillian Caldwell, and I run a global detective agency working to end the human rights abuse, environmental devastation, and corruption associated with the worldwide trade in natural resources. So what do I mean by that? Well, we helped hasten the decline of the bloody Khmer Rouge by halting the illegal timber trade that was funding their operations. Also in the last two decades, we helped focus the eyes of the world on the scourge of so-called blood diamonds and kick-started international systems to ensure that diamonds don't fund or fuel violent conflict. We discovered its secretive mining deals in the Democratic of Congo that left the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to investigate and ultimately New York City hedge fund Oxift to plead guilty to violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and agree to pay $413 million in settlement. We went undercover here in New York City in an Emmy Award-nominated special with CBS 60 Minutes to reveal just how prepared attorneys in more than a dozen New York City law firms were to turn a blind eye to money laundering and incorporate anonymous companies to enable it. And more recently, we discovered a timber trade, an illegal timber trade, stretching from, the pa from Papua New Guinea to China and back here to major retailers in the United States. But today I'm going to tell you a single story, a story about how open data analysis and our investigations helped reveal the people behind the largest natural resource heist in modern history. This story takes us to Myanmar, also known as Burma, a country very much in the news today. Now, Myanmar has long been ruled by a military junta. Today, it's led as a quasi-democracy by Aung San Suu Kyi. But even today, 25% of the seats in Myanmar's parliament are held by the military, and they control key ministries. They have an effective veto over constitutional change. 
Myanmar is a natural resource-driven economy, depending on products such as timber and rubber, minerals, and gas. And the military and their cronies have been given very lucrative business interests. If you were to have a local beer or smoke a local cigarette in Myanmar today, the chances are you would be funding a military company. So this brings me to Jade and this big heist. Global Witness had worked in Burma or Myanmar in the past, but what caught our attention with respect to this investigation was a report by Harvard and Proximity Designs that revealed that the estimated value of jade exports in 2011 was $8 billion. And it wasn't clear where that money was going. Now, jade is an incredibly valuable gemstone. Imperial jade, such as this, goes for many millions of dollars per kilogram. In fact, this necklace sold for over $27.4 million in a four-way bidding war. And as luck or misfortune would have it, the very richest jade deposits in the world lie buried in the ground underneath Kachin State in northern Myanmar, bordering China, which drives jade to those excessive heights because of its elite status. Since its independence from Britain in 1948, successive military regimes in Myanmar have exerted control over resource-rich areas of the country, and you can see here that jade mining in Kachin is indeed a very big business. But how big, nobody really knew, until we released our report in 2015, which revealed that in that year alone, the estimated value of the jade mining business was as much as $31 billion. That would have been 48% of the entire gross domestic product of Myanmar if it hadn't winded up in someone else's pockets. Meanwhile, people surrounding these mines are, of course, living in dire poverty. จะไปจ่าเลยเดี๋ยวมาเป็นเอ่อปีตันเจ้าเดี๋ยวมาเป็นติงนี่ทอละเอ่อปีเลียนไปแล้วตันเนี่ยหาดเฟดเดี๋
the use of open data, and especially design computer program. We started with maps, publicly available maps, and some that we had uh, f photographed surreptitiously inside government offices. And those maps told us the companies to whom Jade mining licenses had been offered. But that didn't tell us who was behind the companies. Next, we had to go to the Burmese company register. This was a searchable database of thousands of companies in Myanmar that enabled us to get access to director and shareholder information, as well as national ID numbers, which is so important in a country like Burma, which has very few unique names. However, this database was painstakingly slow to work with. It didn't have the search function we needed. And it would have taken us weeks to figure out what was going on. So we worked with Open Corporates, which is an open source database of more than 130 million companies worldwide. And we designed a special computer program, and we downloaded the entire Burmese company register, took it offline. And then we're able to automate the process of searching and piecing this information together. We, we uh, captured other information online, for example, information about uh, government sanctions lists, which we scraped from uh, government websites, and we found archived copies of newspapers, which included the names of uh, candidates for office and their national ID numbers. And this helped us paint a picture, and it wasn't a pretty one. The people behind this industry were, not surprisingly, people like General Sway. In fact, a who's who of military generals, men with guns, Chinese interests, and US-sanctioned drug lords. Hidden behind obscure companies with proxy owners, these elites are reaping vast profits, even as the people of Kachin are literally digging the wealth out from underneath their feet. When our report went live in late 2015, it received widespread media coverage globally and in Myanmar. In fact, in Myanmar, there were uh, various newsstands that were downloading uh, the Myanmar, the Burmese version of the report and selling it, which is a little form of micro-enterprise and you know, some cold comfort under the circumstances. But this isn't just about headlines. You know, we investigate, we expose, and we advocate. And so in this report, we called for the government to suspend jade mining licenses until this business is to provide data critical to how the, the industry operates, to ensure that jade is a central tenet and piece of the conversation with respect to peace negotiations, and to conduct social and environmental impact assessments. It's been just over a year, but working closely with allies like the Kachin Networking Development Group, we've achieved some important results. The Myanmar government did suspend jade mining licenses. They formed a gemstone policy working group, which includes civil society, something that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. A gemstone policy, which includes some of our recommendations regarding open data, is making its way through the parliament and a social and environmental impact assessment has been ordered to see if it's even possible to mine jade sustainably in Kachin. This is just one of more than 15 investigations and campaigns we are active and engaging in around the world. Oftentimes, we work through exposés to drive advocacy, and other times, behind the scenes. In China, for example, we're working with, directly with the government to draft their due diligence guidelines for sourcing rubber and timber globally. In Afghanistan, we're trying to ensure that the Taliban doesn't continue to fund itself off the back of the lapis lazuli mines. We're working to keep the forest, the lungs of our planet, standing, protected from illegal logging in places like the Congo Basin, the Amazon Basin, and Southeast Asia. And keep your eyes peeled for a blockbuster new investigation on corruption here in the United States coming to you next week, uh, next month, in partnership with a major news network. In a world turned absolutely upside down, we've got to turn it right side up.
And in a world of so-called fake news, together we can ensure the truth prevails. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian, for that really powerful presentation, which I think is a great example of why we have the Sustainable Development Goals, because issues that affect the lives of people, the environment, and the overall enabling environment, uh, they all should be treated together and in an integrated way. We have time for one quick question from the audience. So who, who has a really sharp question for Gillian? You're speechless. Well, I will ask a question then. Okay. Um, I mean, the SDGs are, of course, about the lives of people. Can you just talk a little bit about how fighting corruption really affects people's day-to-day -day lives and kind of the, the overall empowerment that has happened because of this work that you've been able to do in the exposing of these kinds of issues? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the $31 billion uh, behind this industry would have been 46% of the GDP uh, actually, 48% of the GDP, it would have been 46 uh, times the entire government spending on health that year. Uh, we discovered, you know, a, a, another major corruption deal uh, off the coast of Nigeria that involved Shell and Eni, and that, once again, you know, multiple times the health and education budget spending. So when you're, when you're uh, essentially absconding with the natural resource wealth of these countries, those natural resources become a curse rather than a blessing, drive violent conflict, drive despotic regimes, and there's Western enablers, is, is our point, involved in this entire machinery. It drives aid dependency, and it deprives people of the opportunity not just to survive, but to thrive. Great. Well, thank you again for being here, and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks for <laughs> thank having you. me. Thank you. and talk about how big data is an essential Thanks, tool in achieving the SDGs. Please welcome to the stage Kathy Calvin of the UN Foundation, Michael Green of the Social Progress Imperative, and Mats Granrud of GSMA. And Kathy will be here momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Greetings, gentlemen. Hello. 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 Good morning. So we're going to talk about data again from a somewhat different perspective, and we have two amazing experts. Michael Green is an economist. He used to work at DFID. He's an author with, Mike, uh, with Matthew Bishop of Philanthrocapitalism. Yep. He's one of the 100 most connected men in the UK, whatever that means. But most importantly, he created something called the Social Progress Index. Started playing around with this idea in 2010 and launched it in 2013. It's a really different way to look at how are we making progress besides the traditional form of GDP. So we're going to come back to that because it's all about the kind of data that we really need to be thinking about as we launch the SDGs. Our other panelist is Mats Grinrod, who's the CEO of the uh, GSMA, which is the Mobile Operators Association, 800 mobile operators come together. It's a big job, a lot of bosses. He was in the business himself with two different companies for over 15 years, so he knows, he knows his bosses, but he also knows there's some real opportunities with this sector. And I'll tell you a little bit in a, in, a, in a minute as we ask him to speak about that. But I also want you to know that in his high school days, he was um, a student although he's from Sweden, he was a student in Iowa where he learned all about cow tipping. And I'm, I'm certain that has something to do with where he's gone with his, with his career. But we're going to start oh by, by talking first about the way we think about data as we approach the SDGs. And so, Michael, if you would begin with, with the work that you did. You, you were birthed during the MDGs, which were a different era. Those, those goals were about ending poverty. Now we're talking about getting people into prosperity. They were simpler. They were a little more straightforward. But you actually broke the mold in how we use data by, by creating the Social Progress Index. How are you now thinking about using it for the SDGs? Right. Thanks, Kathy. 
Morning, everyone. I mean, the talk earlier this day has been about sort of moonshots. And I must say, it's funny, I go around the world and people talk to me as if uh, GDP was handed down from God on tablets of stone. <laughs> and of course it wasn't. It was invented by an economist, you know, about 85 years ago. Um, and so we're living in a paradigm that we've created, which means that we actually can create a better paradigm. And what emerged from the social, the social progress index very much emerged from the financial crisis. There's that old saying, you know, you manage what you measure. And we were, we were measuring GDP, we were managing our societies to create more GDP, and we ended up in that frightful mess. Mm -hmm. So really it was sort of a group came together around 2010, um, including Skoll Foundation, Matthew Bishop was part of that, a whole group of us came together and said, well, look, why don't we try and design a different paradigm? And one that's relevant for every country. Because the MDGs were great, but they were focused on poverty. And we said, well, look, we need a frame for every country. This isn't, the development challenge isn't just for poor countries, it's for everyone. And so that was what emerged was the Social Progress Index. Um, and the big thing about Social Progress Index is it's not there to replace GDP. It's to sit alongside as a complement mm -hmm. to GDP. If I just show you how we built it, we sort of created a framework uh, that measures what makes a good society. Um, we went out, we read a lot of literature, we consulted with a lot of people, with economists, political scientists, people in pubs, and came up with this sort of framework of what makes a good society. It's basically three things. A good society is one where everyone has the basic needs of survival, food, water, shelter, safety. A good society is one where everyone has those building blocks of a better life, education, information, health, and a good quality environment. And finally, a good society is one where everyone has the rights, freedoms, uh, and opportunity to advance their knowledge to really pursue their hopes and dreams. And that's a framework that we found you know, consciously very much aligned with the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, we started this before the SDGs, we kept an eye on it, and I think it shows there's a real consensus about what makes a good society. We can often pretend it's all debatable. Actually, there's a huge amount of agreement, and that's captured in the SDGs. And so what we've done is just, on this slide here, just mapped out how the SDGs fit with the Social Progress Index. So very much, Social Progress Index is a way of measuring the SDGs, the spirit and the concepts of the SDGs, perhaps with the exception of SDG 8, which is on economic growth. Mm -hmm. But really, we've got a way that it's Social Progress Index for countries, for states, for cities, for communities, can be a really practical way of measuring progress against the SDGs. And how are you combining data from pubs with data from statistical <laughs> offices? Do they go together at all? So Not this, to mention big data. So this is one of our opportunities in the sense that there's, a, there's the formal reporting systems for the SDGs, which are absolutely critical. But we're actually, because we're a nonprofit, we can improvise a bit mm -hmm. and bring together different forms of data. Wouldn't say it's perfect, really keen to improve. Looking forward to a conversation with Matt's offline later about how we can work more together to find new forms of data. But I'm really excited. I think we've got huge opportunities to measure all these concepts better and make the SDGs real in every community. And that way we'll drive action. Great. Well, Matt, when you took office um, with GSMA a year ago, you said one of the first things you wanted to do was to pull the entire industry behind the SDGs, so big deal to have a whole industry come together, competitors working together toward, for something, and not just behind one goal, but behind the totality of the framework. Why mobile operators? Why the SDGs? Well, uh, from cow tipping to SDGs, then, it's a pretty, <laughs> big, pretty big leap, but I think one of the reasons why I left my my previous job as the CEO of, of uh, European mobile operators was the, the fact that the SDGs are so important for the planet. We're trying to end poverty, combat climate change and fight injustice and inequality, all done by 2030. And it's not so that one company can do it. It's not so that one government can do it. It has to be much, much broader than that. And I saw GSMA, whom I knew uh, you know, before, as a fantastic, powerful, sector-wide entity to be able to influence the SDGs. So why mobile operators? Well, you know, we compete heavily every single day, as we all know. And, uh, but there is one thing that, that unites us, and that is the common purpose that we have, that we, we strive to connect everyone and everything to a better future. And that better future, I don't see anything better than the SDGs to try to create that better future. Mobile operators, we have an awesome reach. We connect today more than five billion individuals globally, and that's a couple of the stats that we will talk about later, Michael, I'm sure. Uh, so if there is one industry, industry-wide sector, that can actually influence 
the SDGs. Mm. I would argue it's the mobile operators. And as you know, it's not an 18th goal called the ICT goal. The ICT community underpins all 17 goals. For us, data is important too, uh, exactly what you said. What, is, what gets, measured, uh, what, what gets uh, uh, measured gets done. And every year we launch a mobile impact report where we clearly show empirically the progress that the mobile operators are doing towards these 17 goals. So this is the second edition, and I'm really proud to say that we are doing progress towards all 17 goals from, from a GSMA perspective. We have just launched uh, a couple of months ago a big data for social good initiative. Uh, because big data is certainly the next step now of, of trying to understand how in, in times of disasters, in times of pandemics, how are we as individuals moving around, how, how are the, the, uh, the communication being affected. So big data for social good is an initiative from the mobile operators. We have today 19 mobile operators that are uh, together in this initiative, uh, covering roughly 2 billion people. 100 countries, and we're now collecting data and very carefully anonymizing that data, working strictly with the code of conduct, because that's the other side of this mm -hmm. that we need to be very, very mindful of to, to make sure that we uh, anonymize the data. We're working with, uh, I think it's eight or 10 UN different organizations, UN Foundation being one, WHO, ITU, uh, UNDP, etc. Uh, to make sure that we are within the, the right boundaries. And this data that we're collecting, we will now o overlay other types of data on that data. So infrastructure, uh, where do we have roads, what's the weather going to be like, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the propensity of diseases. So we will try to create this map of understanding in times of disaster, how are we going to react? So Queen Rania talked a little bit about data equity, and we say two things. You can't have good policy without good data. And if data isn't from everyone, particularly women, it can't be for everyone. So how do you think about these issues of protecting data, ensuring the data genuinely represents the, the truth and isn't something that is fake news and, and fake information? Michael, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah. No, I mean, one of the roles we see of our organization is data advocacy. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many gaps in the data. And, you know, some of that is because, for example, an issue like shelter, because it wasn't part of the MDGs, mm -hmm. really measurement of that issue has lapsed. Um, you know, a whole range of issues. We would love to have a gender lens on every single aspect of social progress. Not yet. I mean, even things like violence against women, we can't get the right data. Mm -hmm. So that's another area. Things like mental health. Some of these new challenges that we're facing that are going to be increasingly important, we've not yet caught up on measuring. So there's, I think there's a huge data agenda that we've got to do if we're really going to measure what's going on in our societies and really get a handle on what's happening and really get a handle on improving. But I'm also optimistic because I think with the technologies we have available, we can catch up really quickly if we can innovate to really measure what our world is really like so we can get a handle on it and make it better. No, I, I agree with you. I think th this is going to be one of the big topics going forward, that we have this awesome power of the data that we're collecting, but used rightly, it is a fantastic power. Used wrongly, it can be completely devastating. So it is a double-edged sword, and, and uh, the mobile operators and, and my board, we're talking continuously about this, on how to make sure that data is treated with the utmost respect, anonymized, etc. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually very hopeful for this. It's sort of the, I don't know if you heard the, the saying, which I learned yesterday, which I thought was pretty good, on, on the man that, or woman that invented the, the pen. Now, the pen can be used to write a very nice letter, <laughs> or it can be used to stab someone in the back. The power is up sure. to us how we want to use this power, and I'm pretty sure that we will come to terms and find good ways of using the, the data, as long as it's true data. And I think the work that the mobile operators are doing is very true. And, and remember, we are also heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no way that data will be sifted off in, into uh, other areas. The, there are other players there collecting data, but it's not the mobile operators. And we need to be so mindful of this. So it's a continuous discussion, and, and I, I'm pretty sure that we will uh, find good ways and, and good sort of boundaries to work with it. 
So, you know, there's uh, less than 5,000 days left <laughs> between now and the end of our deadline of 2030. Not that we're counting yet, but <laughs> the countdown clock is just coming soon. How do we think about what are the most urgent priorities? Um, certainly we'll do a stock taking in 2020, maybe back in this theater. Mm -hmm. But where would you each say you would hope to see some real progress being made first that would mm -hmm. pave the way for the the hockey stick? Is it with governments? Is it with the technology itself? Where would you start? Let me turn to you, Matt. No, first. I think that <coughs> industry-wide uh, activities needs to be done. You know, more companies is fine, but we need to take a more industrial view. It needs to be systemic. Uh, we're working with trials in certain areas, that's fine, but we need to rapidly move away from trials to make a systemic change a change of the way that we view SDGs. And I particularly like what you said on, on the, the GDP, that it's a God-given right, which it's not, obviously. It, it's, it's just one of the, the measures. The people on the planet I mentioned is equally important. And I'm sure that many of our, our members are now working towards measuring not only profit, that's important, but also the people and the planet I mentioned. We need to get that ingrained into our systems. Uh, maybe I can answer your question with a bit of data. Sure. Um, <laughs> so How when refreshing. The, when the SDGs were launched, we, uh, we did some work with Deloitte, one of our su supporters, on to say, can we achieve the SDGs? And the way we worked on this was that we, because we have no uh, GDP in the social progress model, we can look at the relationship between social progress and GDP per capita. Um, and hopefully we've got a slide coming up. Here we go. So what we've done is simply just plotted social progress against GDP per capita, and these are all the countries of the world. And then we've just put the reg a regression line showing the average relationship between GDP and social progress. And what you see is that the, the dots above the line are countries that are good at turning their GDP into social progress, or better at turning their GDP mm. into social progress, and the countries below the line are worse at it. Our world is sitting here. It's below the line. So this is telling us something really important at the beginning, which is yeah, resources are a constraint, but actually with the resources we have, we should be doing so much better. So that's a really important point. The, we then said, well, look, let's forecast and say, can we get to the SDGs? So we converted the SDGs into a social progress score. We think a score of, sort of 75 is a way of getting us to the SDGs. Uh, and then we sort of extrapolated out from that. And what we saw was that uh, if we go all the way to sort of 2015, even if the world economy grows very quickly, we're only going to see a pretty small improvement in social progress. Uh, economic growth on its own is not going to get us to the SDGs. Mm. Business as usual will not get us to the SDGs. We're going to have to do things differently. We're going to have to allocate resources differently. We're going to have to find innovations. Mm. I think there's a bunch of quick wins that we can do, things that we have solved. Things like water and sanitation we should be able to deliver. Other things are going to be more challenging. Mm. So there's a big call for innovation if we're going to get there. Mm. Well, clearly these two guys know that business as usual is not going to work. That is the underlying principle of the SDGs themselves. They are really something very different. So thank you for helping us see the way, and uh, let's keep collecting that good data and right. using it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.